Math with AF Math and Engineering. If you're enjoying this video and our channel, make sure you hit the like button and the subscribe button down below because we're always releasing new videos and new content for engineering students. Enjoy the video. Hey everybody, welcome back. Fred here, AF Math and Engineering. Welcome back to the channel. This video is going to be a continuation of our series on what a civil engineering exams look like. And for this particular video, we're going to go over a course called Structural Analysis. So Structural Analysis, a little bit of background on the course for you. Okay, it's um, essentially it's a third year uh, engineering course. Um, it's taken in the first half of the third year. So, and it's directly after kind of the uh, mechanics of materials courses. So usually we take two mechanics of materials courses, one and two in second year. And then third year, this is the first course that we take and it involves um, mo mostly indeterminate structures. So the first half of the course is kind of determinate and then we move into indeterminate. So this was the midterm for that test. And um, it was actually pretty easy. This test was not so bad. Uh, this was the year... Um, typically the professor that taught this was the hardest professor, uh, hardest marker in the whole school. And like, typically he would fail a lot of people in his courses and, you know, he was notorious for very difficult exams. And, uh, this year specifically he went on sabbatical and we got substitute, um, instructor and he was actually a much easier marker and he gave much more reasonable tests. So this was a pretty easy one. You know, it's, uh, it's easy if you study and you know what you're doing. There weren't too many tricks. So let's take a look. And as always, guys, if you're enjoying these videos and you know, you really, you know, you like this kind of idea of the video and you want to kind of compare what you did to what we did in school over here in Canada, you know, uh, leave a comment down below. So I love, we always love to hear what you guys are thinking. So let's take a look. So we have two hours for this test. Yeah, it's closed book. And the first question is a really straightforward um, moment area method question. By the way, before we actually get into the questions, just remember that we've done a video on all of this stuff. Okay, so if you're looking to pr maybe practice these and you don't know how to do them yet or you want some more practice, um, I'm going to leave all the links to all the videos down below that relate to these questions so you can go and check them out and you can get some more practice in. So the first question asks us to use the moment area method to determine the slope and vertical deflection at point B of the beam. Okay, so that's, um, so that's pretty easy. And actually, this question is fairly simple because um, when you have a, a simply supported beam in just one point load, um, we know that the elastic curve is going to be kind of continuous throughout the whole thing. And what we do with the moment area method is we kind of draw a tangent here. And the tangent, we're going to call that theta A. Okay, and the tangent is to the elastic curve. And the distance at any point from this tangent to the elastic curve, we're going to call that delta C A. Okay, and this could be delta D A, for example. And um, we calculate that by finding the area under the M over EI diagram. Essentially, that's just the moment diagram of this uh, beam uh, divided by EI. And by finding that, we can find, for example, delta C. And we, if we know the distance from A to C, and we know this quantity, a delta DA, and we know theta A, we can find the deflection. That's the idea behind the moment area method. So I'm going to link a video down below if you're interested in that. Um, but it's a pretty basic, it's, it, it can be a difficult concept, actually, if there are hinges in the beam, that kind of stuff. But this question was pretty easy. Uh, and I, I noticed as well in this um, exam, he, the professor, he really liked to kind of change the question. But if you knew your stuff, it wouldn't be kind of that big of a change. Um, so the second part of the question asks, if the load is removed from point C and it's placed at point B, what is the, what are the slope and the deflection at point C? And that is actually Maxwell's law of reciprocal deflections, I believe it's called. So the idea behind that is if we have a linearly elastic beam, okay, so it's compo it's, it behaves linearly elastically, okay, and we apply a unit load at some point, we'll call it B, the deflection at C due to this one unit load would be the same as if we had one uh, a unit load at placed at C, and it would be the same as the deflection at B. So these are equal to each other, these two deflections here. So that's kind of the idea. So for example, if you solved for the deflection at B, and that's what we were looking for in this question, the, the deflection at C and B would be the same if you put the point load at C or B. That's the idea. So let's move on to the next question. And we're asked to use the conjugate B method to determine the vertical deflection at the internal hinge B. So we're asked to find the, uh, the internal, the vertical deflection here, and the slope just to the left of B. So um, 
And yeah, that's telling us to use the principle of superposition. You didn't need to do that. That's fine. That was just kind of like a, a trick if, if you were good at that. But I found that to be more difficult than just drawing the bending moment diagram. The conjugate beam method essentially is we want to create the conjugate beam. So there's a table in the book. And I'll, I'll link you to the video down below so you can check it out. And you replace kind of each restraint with a, a, another restraint. And, um, and then we call that the conjugate beam. And when, once we have the conjugate beam, we draw the, the, um, the M over EI diagram on the conjugate beam. And the shear at any point on the conjugate beam is equal to the slope, and the, and the uh, moment at any point on the conjugate beam is equal to the deflection. That's the idea here. So what we would do is we would um, change this beam into the conjugate beam, and then we would load it, and we would um, draw the M over EI diagram, and we could find our, our slope and our deflection. The second part of this question asks, are the slopes just to the right and the left of the internal hinge equal? Why? And, um, you know, if you want to think about that for a second, pause the video and, and maybe um, kind of apply your understanding and your knowledge. Um, go, for an, go for an answer on that. But uh, essentially what a hinge does, an internal hinge creates kind of a discontinuity in the elastic curve. Okay, so if we have uh, an elastic curve here, so we have our curve, and remember that the elastic curve represents the deflection of the beam. So our beam is deflecting, 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 because we have a load here. And then once we get to the hinge, it actually acts as an inflection point. See? So that's kind of how, so the, the, this, the curvature of the elastic curve is going to reverse. And as a result of that, to the left and the right of the hinge, um, the slopes are not going to be equal because they're going to be, one's going to be convex and one's going to be concave. So um, I actually talked to a few people after the exam and they got that one wrong. So that's a good point to note. Let's look at question three. So uh, question three asks us to, and as you can see, I mean, it was two hours and there's one, two, three, and then there's going to be four or five questions and then a short answer qu section. So it, was, um, it wasn't that hard of an exam, but you did need to kind of go fast. And this one took a little bit of time. So. Um, in this one, we're asked to use the virtual work method to calculate the vertical deflection at point C of the structure. Relative EI values for the two beams are shown, and for the cable AE. So this is a this is a big hint. I know a lot of people had problems with this. And for the beams, a neglect axial load deformation. So what we have here is we have a beam. We have a beam. They're non-prismatic, so one has a bigger uh, section size or more stiffness than the other. And we have a cable. Okay, so remember, we didn't have a formula sheet for this. So you needed to remember kind of the, the formulas for virtual work. So we have our, um, our expression for our beam here, uh, MVM over EI, where MV is the moment uh, equation for the beam in the, virtual, uh, in the virtual beam. So with the one kilonewton point load applied to the point of interest, M is the, the moment expression kind of in terms of X that is derived, and sorry, this is DX that is derived using the real loads, the loads that are, the internal loads that are applied. And finally, we have EI of the beam, okay? So that, this formula we're going to apply to this beam and this beam here. However, this cable here, okay, that's a tension member, okay? So a tension member has a different formula, okay? And remember, for tension members, we don't have bending moments. What we have is axial forces, right? Axial forces and axial forces are governed by the area, okay? So, and then we are gonna have either tension or compression. So in that case, we have a different formula for uh, trusses. And we have that the deflection of a truss, vertical deflection of a truss, is going to be given by okay, where, uh, the summation. So the summation of all of the members, FV being the virtual, um, the, the force in the member when the virtual load is applied to the point of interest. F is the force due to the real uh, loads. L length EA divided by EA. So what we're going to do is we're going to add up all of these uh, we're going to apply this to this beam, to this beam, then we're going to apply this to the cable. We're going to add them all up, and we're going to get our deflection. So that's, um, that, one, that one was um, tricky, but easy if you need the trick. Second, uh, fourth question, we have Castellano's second theorem. We're given a pretty simple frame here, and we're asked to determine the vertical deflection at joint C. So um, that's pretty straightforward, this one. Um, the Castellano's theorem, essentially you apply a fictitious load. Uh, well, it's only fictitious if there's no load here, which there isn't. So we apply our load P. Um, we, we did a whole video on this actually, so I'm not really gonna explain the derivation. You can go check it out, I'll leave the link down below. Um, but essentially we apply a fictitious load P. It's equal to zero if there's no load there. And if there is a load, then we equal P to that load. And we kind of take a section of each, uh, we, we, we derive the moment expression for each um, each section of the beam, and we apply P in the in the direction that we want. Uh, you could apply it. Okay, and here we have, I just written out the formula for uh, Cassiano's theorem. So we take the partial derivative of uh, M, okay, the M formula, so we derive the moment expression for each section, 
and we do it kind of in terms of p as well. And then we take the partial derivative of those two with respect to p, and we multiply that by m of each section divided by ei. So um, I did. I also did a you know a pretty long video, uh, two videos on that actually, which I will link below. And this was actually a pretty straightforward question. So no tricks here, neglecting axial load deformation of the frame. So finally, we have um, some kind of tricky, um, you know, determinate. Uh, indeterminate, statically determinate, um, or unstable questions. So we just have to go over the frames. Uh, we have a beam here, a frame, and a truss, and we need to just evaluate um, whether or not the number of equations we have exceeds uh, the number of unknowns. And if they're equal, it's a determinate uh, structure. So that's pretty much that one. And then finally, we're given some uh, some kind of short answer questions, and you're not really given how many marks they're worth, so that was kind of a maybe unsettling a little bit, but uh, nevertheless, they weren't too hard. Uh, first one asks, you know, advantages and disadvantages of statically indeterminate structures compared to determinate structures. So, um, you know, advantages of statically indeterminate structures would be, you know, they're, they have redundance in case something fails, they're stiffer. Disadvantages would be, you know, they're, they're more likely to kind of, um, you know, uh, if there's a thermal expansion, for example, in a fixed fixed beam, this this beam has nowhere to go, so it could cause internal stresses to develop in areas where they wouldn't in a determinate beam because there are places for it to move. So those are just a couple. Uh, determinate structures are also easier to evaluate. And what are the limitations for Cassiano second theorem? A couple of them would be, you know, Cassiano second theorem. You know, there needs to be. Uh, the material needs to be linearly elastic, and you know the structure needs to be determinate. So these kind of questions are, you know, it's it's important for these to read the book, read the section that you're studying, and really kind of understand what it is that um, the theories behind these. Because if they ask you these, you do need to know that. And finally, um, Maxwell's law of reciprocal deflection. We kind of went over this in the other one, but it's the idea is again, and I'll just go over one more time: is if we have two structures here, two beams, both linearly elastic. And if I draw the elastic curve for both, say if I apply a load one and I apply a load one, okay, okay, and this load one, uh, let's say this is B and point C, and then we have point B and C. The idea is is the load that we apply at B causes a deflection at C is the same deflection at B if we applied the same load at C. That's the idea behind uh, Maxwell's laws of reciprocal deflection. So. That's uh, that's the test. Let me know. Uh, let me know if you thought that this was a tough test. I thought it was actually a pretty straightforward one. Um, you know, some people did have problems with it. And uh, if you did know your stuff, it, it wasn't too hard. Um, yeah, let me know if you like this video. Uh, let me know down below if you thought this video was interesting, if you liked the test, uh, your thoughts on it, and if you want to see more. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Take care.